Well, it's good to see everybody this evening. I want to uh, continue with our presentation of uh, blood alcohol level and uh, behavioral uh, effects. This is the third in, uh, in the, the, the uh, uh, series here uh, with this topic. And I'd mentioned in the first two that we uh, did a little earlier uh, today that uh, tonight we're going to take a look at kind of comparing two people and uh, uh, showing you how blood alcohol level can be used as a diagnostic tool as well. Uh, in the first segment, uh, we had, uh, just to kind of recap, we had talked about um, what that number means, how it's generated, some of the myths that certainly uh, swirl all around it, um, and uh, uh, how small a number that actually represents. Uh, in the second segment, we talked about five things that cause blood alcohol level to rise, and we talked about two things that cause it to drop, and all the myths that kind of surround that as well. Well, again, I had mentioned in the, the first segment that um, it's not that I'm not concerned with anybody's legal well-being. I never want anybody to, to hear it or feel this way. But blood alcohol level and that number has a whole lot of other uses as well. It's not just a legal limit, legal snare above a certain level. They, they've got you. Um, it also can be used as a clinical tool. It can be used as a diagnostic tool. When we first started uh, uh, this uh, particular topic, I had asked for a couple people to, if they wanted to volunteer, if they remembered or ever had their blood alcohol level checked. And I also mentioned if you wanted to do I have a friend who, you certainly could, uh, could do it that way. And uh, that was perfectly okay. And we got kind of a, a, a representative sample. And I put them up on the board in the first segment. And we're going to use uh, those as kind of a, a point of reference. And the usual numbers that we hear, kind of the old standard, 0.108, which is the new legal limit, new standard in Maryland, and has been for, for quite a while. And then a couple of uh, variations. And then this little guy here that we're going to spend some time with here in a few minutes that uh, uh, very near and dear to my heart. This guy was a patient of mine a number of years ago. And not only is that level uh, quite high, there's a very unique situation surrounding uh, that. And I had mentioned that one of these things that we talk about, these uh, numbers and behaviors and that type of thing are not etched in stone. They're averages. So some people perform a little better at a certain level, some a lot worse at a certain level. So these are kind of just a, a, a guideline. We had also talked about a couple of factors that um, uh, play into uh, to this. We had talked about some constants that we see. We talk about uh, this whole idea of uh, um, metabolism, tolerance, that type of thing. If you were here for the second segment, you know, I, I won't go through all that again, but you know, you'll see how this plays out in this uh, particular situation as well. And we talked about two constants that you're really going to see here in a minute when we talk about it as a clinical tool. And the two constants are alcohol detoxes at the rate of an ounce per hour, you can't speed that up. You can't slow it down. It's built in. There's only one time that that number and that uh, situation doesn't hold true. And we'll talk about that here in a minute. And also the fact that one ounce of alcohol raises a person's blood alcohol level approximately a 0.02. So those are kind of some constants that we work with. I wanted in this segment again, I want to compare two people, like I said, show you how we use this as a diagnostic thing. I had mentioned in one of the segments that one of the things that I'll ask people, if they come in as a result of a legal intervention, I'll ask if they remember what their blood alcohol level might have been. And I ask that for two reasons. One is because I need to find out um, where the person was at the time of, of the arrest in terms of their number, because so many states dictate uh, at a certain level and, and number of offenses, whether a person's involved in group for six weeks, 12 weeks, 26 weeks, whatever it might be. But the thing that I really focus on is where I, can, again, can use this as a diagnostic situation. I want to know the situation. How were you performing um, uh, at the time of arrest? Um, because that can speak volumes about where you are on this, this chart. So 
I've had people in the past that were kind of on the fence. Um, uh, in the education groups, I tell people, I want them to be able to make a decision based on facts, not feelings, about whether um, their situation is an issue or not. In treatment groups, again, most of us, you know, myself included, we know where we are in kind of the scheme of things. But I've had people who are kind of uh, hemming and hawing and not real sure of, again, is I is or is I ain't. And this little chart can be one of the factors that helps push them one way or the other. So with that, I'm going to uh, go ahead and uh, show you a comparison between two folks okay, and various levels of intoxication. We had talked this afternoon in one of the segments about tolerance. And tolerance is how a person performs at a certain level. Okay? Tolerance has nothing to do, and I mentioned this also, you have to kind of listen to this careful, because it sounds kind of twisted. Tolerance has nothing to do with the amount of alcohol on board. I had mentioned if you have two people drinking drink for drink, and you know, uh, all factors are equal, the factors we looked at uh, in the previous segment, if all factors are equal and you've got two people sitting there and after three or four drinks, one person saying, well, I'm just now kind of getting in the mood and kind of priming the pump. And you've got the other person who's about to pass out or fall asleep or you know, they've got the same amount of alcohol on board. What's different is how they react to that. And that's what tolerance is all about. So we're going to take a look at, at the differences in, in that, uh, uh, that concept. These again are, we've used this little uh, chart probably for about 40 years. Um, uh, again, they're estimates, uh, they're averages, so again, nothing's etched in stone. For the social drinker, point one, the social drinker is considered to be intoxicated. And certainly in all states, if uh, drive-in certainly would be uh, 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 subject to a, a DWI or DUI. So again, point one, the person's considered to be intoxicated. Point two, we consider the person to be severely impaired. Now this is where a person has had a few too many. They certainly, you know, show the signs and symptoms of it. Um, maybe uh, uh, staggering a little bit. Their reaction time is slowed. You can definitely tell the person's had a few. Okay. Point three: social drinker. It's a good possibility he or she's unconscious. Okay. Now, this is an important factor. We're going to come back to this in a minute. I'm just going to put the rest of the chart up here and then go back to, to this one. Point four, it's a real good possibility the social drinker is in a coma or lapsing into a coma. Point five, death is a real possibility. Okay. Now, go back to unconsciousness. Unconsciousness is the body's kind of uh, safety net, uh, uh, fuse, circuit breaker. Okay? Every so often, not as often as you would think, you might hear about somebody being here or being at this level. But before a person can get to that point, unconsciousness happens and the person passes out. And you can't drink anymore if you're passed out unless you've got a really good friend who's pouring it down your throat and, you know, that, that whole scenario. So again, when you pass out, you can't drink anymore. We had mentioned that uh, uh, this afternoon that two things that have, uh, have an impact on blood alcohol level and how quickly it drops. The first one is you don't add any more to the system, okay, and time passes, so both of those uh, features are kind of in play here. If you're unconscious, you can't drink anymore. Unconsciousness is the brain's way of seeing a panic situation. Unconsciousness basically is the brain's inability to get oxygen out of the bloodstream. Alcohol interferes with the brain's ability to do that. It doesn't allow that transfer. So the brain starts to shut systems down so we don't hurt ourselves any more than, than, uh, than uh, maybe already have happened. So unconsciousness is kind of that ceiling. Person drinks to get to this point and they pass out. They can't drink anymore. Time passes, you're not adding more to it. So some's going to detox out and you go back through all these different stages. 
Okay? Take two people, two friends drinking drink for drink, uh, maybe out together, and you know, uh, and they're sitting there, and they both get to a point where they both pass out. Okay, this is a hypothetical situation, and they both pass out. And after time passes, they both come to, and they look at each other and go, God, I've never had that happen before. And the other person says, nah, me either. Well, the one person says, I don't know about you, but I've I got to think about this. I'm going home. Okay? Well, as he or she goes home, time's going to pass. No more is added to the system. Eventually, they're going to go back to zero. Okay? Suppose the other friend kind of looks at it from another angle and they say, you know, you're right. I've never had that happen either. I've got to think about this. Give me another drink. Well, halfway through that, that next drink, they hit that wall again and they pass out. Time passes, they come to and it's like, good Lord, it's happened twice. I really got to think, fill me up again. Technically, they can hit this wall or ceiling a number of times. It's a safety valve. Very rarely do you see this happen and this happen because that interferes. When you see or hear about, we have a very strange name for it. When you read or you see this a lot of times in the spring, um, in the fall with uh, fraternity uh, and sorority initiations or graduation parties, where there's drinking contests and, and a lot of alcohol consumed in a very short period of time. Very often, you'll read about somebody dying from alcohol poisoning. And I think people misconceive or, or have a misconception of what, what that means, because when we hear you know, alcohol poisoning, immediately you think of, of uh, food poisoning. You know, well, alcohol poisoning doesn't mean you got a hold of a bad batch of alcohol where if it's food poisoning, you got a bad batch of seafood or whatever it might be. Alcohol poisoning means, basically, the person drank so much so fast, they bypass this. The brain doesn't have a chance to engage that mechanism, and they end up here or they end up there. Okay? So very rarely, I mean, certainly you know, more times than, than we'd like to see, but not as often as people would think because we have this mechanism that says, you might want to continue, but I don't, and the body shuts itself down. Okay? Watch the alcoholic. Here's where you start to see a little bit of a, a different characteristic here. Point one, the alcoholic is considered to be at a maintenance level. And maintenance level goes, uh, there's a lot of definitions and, and, and that type of thing, but the one that I like to work with, maintenance for me back in the day, if my blood alcohol level dropped below 0.1, I went into withdrawals. So the social drinker zero is zero. The alcoholic zero is 0.1. Now, for a lot of us, my cruising speed, and I, I don't mean to make fun of it, but my cruising speed was higher than that. You know, my, my need and what I had to have on board to keep from going into withdrawals was somewhere close to, to point two. Here's where you can see the real difference in the situation. I tell education groups all the time, if you were here a number of months ago, when we did Is I Is or Is I Ain't and looked at signs and symptoms, I mentioned you could use those also as kind of a relapse prevention tool of not only the things that uh, we certainly did, uh, but the things that are kind of yet to come. Um, I can look at a list of signs and symptoms, and everything on that list occurred in my drinking except for two things. And this is where this becomes even more remarkable. The two things that never happened was I never got arrested. And I tell people, it wasn't from lack of trying. I mean, it just never happened. My cruising speed, again, was always somewhere in here. That's what I needed to function. Well, you know, here and a little lower now, but at the time before I got sober, point one was the, the, the standard. Every time I got in the car, I was under the influence. And I did that three, four, five, six times a day. 
driving to work, driving home for lunch, because you can't drink at work, because somebody might think you have a problem, you know, drive back to, to work, you know, um, drive home in the evening, drink a little bit, wait till everybody finally went to sleep, go back to the liquor store, and that kind of, so I was behind the wheel, you know, half a dozen times easily every day. So again, the fact that I never got arrested is just absolutely a miracle. The other that never occurred is another miracle. I'm not dead yet. And I know those two things are the only thing left for me to see out there, and that holds no charm for me whatsoever. So point one, and I know a lot of times people will uh, um, kind of uh, um, quibble about this a little bit. The maintenance person goes by another name as well. That's what we call the functional alcoholic or the functional addict. Um, we just happen to be talking about alcohol tonight, but a lot of other drugs of choice carry this, uh, this little uh, uh, situation as well. The functional alcoholic, and I always tell you, if you're new, I don't want you to panic. I wasn't doing this kind of work. But years and years ago, I could do my job better drunk than most people sober. And then after a while, I couldn't do my job and then I couldn't hold a job, and then I couldn't find a job. The progression started to... But I could function fine. You know, I used to win you know, Employee of the Month awards all the time, you know, and people would say, the, the owner of the company I worked for, it's, I wish I had more employees like John, and I'd be standing there at 7.30 in the morning getting this award, and I'm already you know, three sheets to the wind. Say, you know, and I'm thinking in the back of my mind, you mean drunk like me? But, you know, no, nobody, nobody saw that. So I was the functional drunk. I could do my job better drunk than most people sober. Now we take this whole list and we kind of push it up. Um, we kind of skew it up a little bit here. Now at point two, the alcoholics considered to be intoxicated. Again, social drinkers really struggling. And if you're new, I paint with a broad brush. When I say we, I'm not labeling, I'm talking about me. Okay. We're just now showing some signs that we've had a few. Point three, the alcoholic severely impaired, social drinkers passed out. Point four, the alcoholic's unconscious or about to lapse into unconsciousness. Social drinker, the possibility of being in a coma is, is very real. Point five, coma is a possibility. The social drinker, the possibility of being dead is certainly there. Point six, death is a real possibility. You can see just from these numbers, and like I said, that's kind of the standard that we use. There's exceptions to every rule, and we're going to talk about one of those here in a minute. You can see why I would ask somebody, um, again, when you went into the hospital, you know, if you were going into to, uh, to treatment, or if you were going into wherever, or if you were, were arrested, what was the circumstances? How were you reacting? How were you behaving? Okay? If I have somebody that says, well, you know, I, I knew I had a few too many, and I pulled off to the side of the road, and I'm just sitting there, and an officer comes up to you know, see what the situation is. And if you're sitting there, especially in the state of Maryland, if the keys are in the ignition, the car doesn't have to be running. It's a moving violation. So you can be just as, just as arrested moving as, as not moving. And the person said, you know, I just, I knew I couldn't function. They do a breath of, yeah, I blew a 1.7 or a 1.9. Well, you know, at that point, that person's probably over here. I've had people say, well, you know what? You know, I was driving down the road and I had a tail light out and they pulled me over to give me a work order. And oh, by the way, have you been drinking? And well, yeah, I've had, had a few. And, you know, they did a breathalyzer and I blew a 3-1. Okay, that ain't social use. Okay, because here, the social drinker, that's not going to be an issue. If you're functioning fairly well at a higher level, there might be some other things going on there. And addiction certainly can be one of those things. Like I had mentioned a few minutes ago, we certainly look at blood alcohol level as a legal indicator, but it also has some other values, and that's what I really wanted to focus on uh, for the time that we're, we have in uh, uh, the rest of this little presentation. <clears throat> this guy here, 
and 5'2". Okay? Now, there's no doubt in his mind when I first met him, he knew he was alcoholic. I mean, there was no on the fence, is I is or is I ain't. He certainly knew. This happened probably, God's almost 20 years ago now, I guess. I came to this area and started to work for a treatment facility that was doing something very unique and very cutting edge at the time. It's certainly not now. It's kind of a standard thing. In fact, some of you may have uh, had the experience. We were doing something that we call today outpatient detox. Well, it was a little different back in the early 90s. Outpatient detox, we had a little spin on it. Today, if a person goes to outpatient detox, they may go and get their medication, um, maybe do a, a group or not. You know, it might be there for a, an hour or two or three. We did something called partial hospitalization. And the person was there all day, went home in the evening. They were monitored by a family member or trusted, you know, significant other. And then they came back the next day, and they were there all day. So it was kind of inpatient, but you went home at night and came back in the, in the morning. You were heavily monitored medically through the whole process. We had a really strict criteria uh, for who would be admitted um, because of uh, complications. If a person had a history of seizures and that type of thing in detox or in withdrawals, we certainly would refer the person to the hospital and, and do it a little different way. But this was kind of a unique thing. People would come in. 8 o'clock in the morning, have their vitals checked, get their meds, go to group with me at 9, do group until 11, and then have a break until lunchtime. And then at noon, AA or NA or CDA came in, did kind of an eating meeting um, at noontime. And then at 1 o'clock to 3 o'clock, they did group with me again. And then we did individual up until 5 o'clock when their loved one came to pick them up. Now, It was very safe because of the the guidelines we had in place. And also, um, I was the clinical director, the partner I had in in this. Um, She was the medical director. And we were available 24 hours a day. And people had very strict instructions about what to do if something started to kind of go sideways. And, And we never had any incidents, never had any problems. So the system worked really well. Well, one of the things that we demanded when a person first came in, and I know that might sound like a strong word, but it's, it's important. We demanded that the person, the first time they came in, the first morning, that their husband, wife, girlfriend, boyfriend, mom, dad, significant other, whoever was going to be the responsible person in the evening came in as well and sat and talked with our nurse to kind of uh, get some uh, instructions and, and, and that type of thing. This guy called one afternoon, and kind of the typical story that, you know, was my, my story too, and probably a lot of yours as well. The old sick and tired of feeling sick and tired. He said, I got to do something. He said, I really don't know if I can go the inpatient route. He said, you know, kind of uh, typical, you know, traditional um, outpatient at the time. I've done that a zillion times. I need something kind of in between. And I heard about you guys, and you might be the thing I'm looking for. So our nurse gave him the instructions about uh, what he needed to do, and uh, and told him, you know, to uh, come in in the morning, and we would get the process started. And one thing that we always told somebody, maybe you've been told this too, and to laymen and people on the outside, even family members, this sounds so bizarre. It's an alcoholic's dream come true. One of the first things we would tell the person to do between now and tomorrow morning, don't stop drinking. Okay, and people, it's like, wow, I like this program already. <laughs> you know, it's like, this, this is great. And we would tell them that because we don't need you to go into seizures that night. Alcohol is the only drug a person can die in withdrawals from because of blood pressure problems, seizure problems, a whole lot of other medical issues. So we would tell the person, which for me, when I was you know, looking at going into treatment, that was no problem whatsoever, because a lot of us go out with a blaze of glory, and I'm going to rehab tomorrow, so what the hell, here we go. Well, he was all for that, so uh, we said, now don't forget, you know, make sure your, your wife, who was going to be his, uh, his, uh, his guardian, make sure she comes in with you. The next morning comes, 
He walks into the office, and he sits down in the nurse's office, and she asked him, where's your wife? And he said, well, she's, uh, she had an emergency meeting at, at work, and uh, she'll be here tonight uh, to pick me up, and she'll talk to you then. And Pat, who was our nurse, said, well, I've got to ask you, you know, how did you get here? He said, I drove in. And she said, well, you know, he goes, no, 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 it's all right. I've got a friend coming to pick up my car, you know, and, you know, things are fine. Pat said, okay, you know, let's, let's not do that again. But you're here. So she starts doing her evaluation and, and vital signs and all the stuff you, you do to start off. Now, I'm down the hall in my office, um, you know, probably, you know, 50 yards down the hall, and I'm pulling stuff together for the 9 o'clock group. And I know he's here because I, I saw him come in, and I hear Pat down the hall go, oh, my God. Now, that's not a good thing to hear any time, especially in a doctor's office, especially, you know, in, when you're dealing with what we all deal with. And so I jump up. I get about halfway out the door and almost get run down because here comes Pat running into my office. And she's got, we had a little portable breathalyzer that we used just because you have to have, I mean, that's part of checking vitals. And she's got it in her hand. She's got the button still depressed, so his reading is still showing. And she said, look at this. And I looked at it, and it was a 5-2. I thought, who is this? She said, the guy that just walked in. I said, are you sure? She said, you saw him walk. It's, it's him. And I thought, good Lord. And then she said, when's the last time we had this piece of junk calibrated? I said, well, I just got it back, but I think we need to send it out again. Well, we had a spare that we used for when one was out being calibrated. So I opened the drawer and handed it to her and said, here, you know, see what you come up with this time. Well, she walks back down the hall to her office. And a couple minutes later, I hear, oh, my God. And I'm thinking, once is bad enough, twice is and same scenario, I'm halfway out the door, and she runs me over, and she goes, look at this. It's a 5-2. And it's like, well, the two pieces of junk can't be that off and be the same. It's like, this is really kind of bizarre, to say the least. So I walk down the hall, and there's our guy sitting at Pat's desk, sober as a judge, you know, of, of, you know apparently, you know, the way he's behaving, and I walk in, and he goes, hey, Doc, I'm qu uh, creating quite a stir, aren't I? I said, yes, you are. And I said, did you happen to see this? You know, which is a dumb question. It's like, yeah, it's me, you know. <laughs> I said, I got to ask you. I said, I know we probably told you, keep drinking and, you know, that kind of, and I'm sure you did. I'm sure you followed directions to the, to, to the letter of the law, you know. I said, I got to ask you. How much did you have to drink last night? He said, oh, my God, I don't know. You know, I was running around the house finding bottles that I hid. And, you know, I'm going out in a blaze of glory. And it's just, and, and I'm looking at this going, but you're sitting here telling me the story like you're perfectly coherent, which he was. And I said, when was your last drink? And he said, honestly, I said, yeah. He said, in the car to get up enough nerve to come in here. I said, so are we talking about, it was like, he goes, no. He said, I found a half pint under the front seat. It was like one, one, one little bite. He said, and I you know, threw that back and walked in the door. And I thought, there is no way in the world he could blow a 5-2, walk in the door. Now, I came from a hospital-based background. I had seen people with blood alcohol levels that high and a little higher, but they didn't walk into the office. They came in by ambulance. They were in really bad shape. They certainly were unconscious. Sometimes they were in a coma. I mean, they were in really dire straits. Never had one walk in the office and ask, where do I start? Okay. So I looked and I thought, well, there's only one thing we can do. We can assume that for whatever reason, excuse me, that both of these breathalyzers are way off base. But again, how do you explain that they're off base with the same number? 
We could assume that those numbers are wrong and start the medication process and start detoxing you right now. Now the problem is, in medicine, some of you might be familiar with this, we have something that's called a synergistic effect. And a synergistic effect is the effect of one drug or medication, you know, you would think would be, you know, this plus the effect of the other. It doesn't work that way. The synergistic effect means it's the effect of this times the effect of this. So technically, if we had assumed that that number just couldn't possibly be right, that maybe the, the, you know, the, the five was stuck and it was a one, two, not a five, two or something, and we started to medicate him at that point, we could have killed him. Okay? So we had to make sure, and then I thought, there's only one way to really see if this number is anywhere close to accurate. And this is where we can use this as a clinical tool. Okay? I don't get to do this much anymore because of you know, uh, what I do now and, and out of the hospital type of, of setting and have been for quite a while. But I used to, to uh, see this a lot. I know these are constants. So what I told our guy, I said, now what I want you to do, if you don't mind, I said, there's nothing we can do right now. I said, you're just going to have to, you can come sit in group if you want. You can go sit in the waiting room and read some crappy magazine. You know, but there's nothing we can do right now. I said, in about an hour, if it's okay with you, I'm going to come and I'm going to do another breathalyzer. And he goes, well, I'm here all day, you know, whatever you got to do. Okay. Group broke at 10 o'clock to, just to take a, a, a bathroom and smoke break. And I go out to the waiting room and there's our guy sitting there just happy as he can be reading a magazine and uh, looks fine. And I said, well, can I do it? He goes, Absolutely. And the number I saw was this. And I thought, well, it's still a little unusual that he'd be that high and functioning. But knowing kind of the, the chemistry behind this, it's a good possibility this number might be real. Kind of doing reverse engineering. Okay. If alcohol, if one ounce raises a, a person's blood alcohol level approximately a 0.02, if it detoxes at the rate of an ounce per hour, we can pretty much figure it's going to come out a 0.02 every hour. Okay? That's exactly where I would expect him to be. Now, I still couldn't explain it, didn't understand it, but you know, it looked like this might be real. An hour later, come in and ask him again, and it's a 4.8. And you kind of, you know, you know the rest of the story. Through the course of the day, it's looking like this. It's coming out exactly, oh geez, can edit that out. <laughs> it still surprises me. It's coming out exactly the way we would expect it. Again, got no idea why or how it's that high, but the mechanics are working exactly the way they should. Well, towards the end of the day, his wife comes in to pick him up and He's still, um, he's sitting there, you know, he came in, sat in one of the groups and then sat and read another magazine for a while and his blood alcohol level by the time he left was still way too high because only eight hours had passed. There's no way in the world we could start medicating and get him in, in, you know, into detox. So we gave him a, an alternative. We sat down, the, Pat and I sat down with him and his, and his wife and so we have two alternate, two choices. It's still going to be quite a while before we can do anything for you. Our recommendation will send you to the hospital. You can medically detox, be medically monitored, and 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 then when you're done, you can come back to us, and and we'll you know we'll get you involved in in, in treatment. Or the other option, and it's your choice. Go home, don't drink tonight. And that's when we told his wife, if you see the least little wiggle that there's a problem or something's about to happen, don't hesitate, call 911, get him to the, to the hospital and, and get it handled. 
We're on 24-hour call. Let us know what's going on. Well, they chose that option because he didn't really want to go to the hospital. But he said, if things start, he said, I'll, I'll be honest and I'll tell her if I'm struggling and, and, you know, we'll handle it that way. The next morning when he came in, he was absolutely miserable. And he was well below where we could start to detox him and, and that kind of thing. Okay. You look at this number and you think that there's no way possible that could happen looking at this chart. He should have at least been here, close to here. And again, like I said, if there was any doubt that he was alcoholic, this certainly uh, dispelled that, uh, that situation because you know, he was well beyond this limit and this level. He ended up doing fine. Everything worked out just, just perfect for him. Um, stayed sober for a number of years. Um, I lost touch with him years and years ago, but everything you know, seemed to be no worse for wear. Now, again, this is where we can use this as a clinical diagnostic thing. Okay? Knowing that this is the math, this is what we expect, we know that that probably was a realistic number. The other thing this number tells us, and we certainly would back it up with a lot more than just doing breathalyzers and monitoring, the only time alcohol doesn't detox at that rate is when the liver's involved and is compromised and it can't. And then you see all kinds of bizarre numbers because the liver's doing the best it can. Okay? I would see this every so often in the, in the hospital. You have somebody come in and, you know, going to do an evaluation to see if they were going to go upstairs to the inpatient unit. And they come in and they might be, a, you know, a 2 5. And then you would check, you know, later on and, you know, they're a 2 3 and we're doing all the paperwork and, you know, they're 2 1 and they're doing exactly what you think is going to happen. Every so often, you might have somebody would come in, let's say they're, you know, 1 9. And you start doing all the paperwork and everything, and you check the number again, and it's a one nine. And you know they didn't sneak out to fortify themselves. They haven't gone anywhere. They're still sitting right there. Okay. And then you see something looks like this, and then something looks like this, and then something looks like this. The number's just all over the place. The liver is detoxing at the best rate it can. That gives us a clear indication that something else is going on. Now, like I said, we certainly would back it up with, uh, you know, doing liver enzyme studies and, you know, typical regular blood work that most people may have had just to check to make sure. But again, just that little, little kind of inconsistency in this number and how the person detoxes speaks volumes. So again, blood alcohol level and that number is not just a legal snare, not just a legal uh, limit. There's a lot of other clinical value we can use this for. Somebody asked me not too long ago, um, what was the highest that I had ever seen? And the highest I ever saw, and certainly wasn't in sitting in my office uh, type of thing, the highest I ever saw was at the hospital, and the person was a 7-1. Um, I mean, that's just astronomical, and by anybody's terms. The highest ever recorded that I'm aware of was a hospital program in Vermont years ago. They had a person come into the emergency room in a coma, near death, and ultimately they, they did, uh, did die. Their blood alcohol level was a 9-3. Now, that's as close to perfection in, in kind of a twist. You know, 1.0 is perfect. Okay? You can't get to that level, okay? 9-3. And again, like I said, the person didn't survive, but that's, that's the highest. Now, a number of years ago, just a little quick um, story, and we'll wrap this up here in a few minutes. It's just a little short uh, tail end of, of uh, this uh, day-long presentation here. One of the things, I never, uh, years and years ago, somebody asked, is there any reason why you might have somebody at this level 
and still be functioning and somebody at a lower level not being able to function at all. And we didn't have any definitive um, idea or, or data. NIH years and years ago did a study And I remember because all the treatment programs in the country at the time, they were sent a memo or or a little little letter asking if anybody uh, in the treatment uh, profession had anybody that they had worked with with unusually high levels and seemed to be kind of out of the norm. Well, I had my guy here. And I was still in touch with him and, uh, at, the, at the time. And what they wanted was they were going to give people a couple of weeks of not free treatment, but uh, free room and board while they ran a zillion tests to try to figure out how does this happen when most mere mortals, you know, that would have uh, certainly never would have gotten to that level. So they had all these people... Um, uh, refer patients. They got in touch with these people. A lot of them came in. They were paying for the person to to fly in or whatever and gave them room and board and and ran all these tests. And we were all, and they said, if you send somebody, we certainly will send you a copy of the final report so you know what we found. And so a lot of us that sent people were just kind of waiting with bated breath to figure out what they found out. Was it genetic? Was it hormonal? Was it some enzyme? Was it this? Was it that? Was it? And the final report basically came out and said, we don't know. Just some people are different. <laughs> okay, and it's like, well, that's fantastic. Well, that's basically what we look at. These numbers are guidelines. And again, if you know, certainly with math, um, anytime you have an average That means somebody scored a little higher, somebody a little lower, okay? These are the ones that we've used, like I said, for probably 40, 45 years. I've been doing this for almost 30 years, and this this little chart had been around forever when I started doing this. Nobody's ever seen any need or reason to change this, so this still is the standard that that we use. It certainly, like I said earlier, can be used as a legal intervention thing. But again, it can be used as a diagnostic tool. How was I performing at a certain level? You know, and again, I'm serious. I've seen people sitting right on the fence and not real sure, and then look at how they were performing at a certain time when their blood alcohol level was measured, and that can be the thing that pushes them one way or the other. And then we can use it as a clinical tool to see you know, is there anything else going on in here? Okay, so this number is a very powerful little number. And uh, like I said in the first segment, uh, people today still misinterpret what that number actually represents. Um, if you weren't here for the first segment, we had talked about uh, this whole idea that people, when they look at that number, see it as 10% of something, 52% of something. Bless you. And people say, there's no way in the world I could ever achieve a a level where 10% of my blood is alcohol or, you know, whatever. In reality, they're absolutely right. That number represents a very small amount. We looked at the formula in the first segment. This number is a fraction of a fraction. Where this number, just to kind of close and and remind people of this, this number is generated by a formula. It's parts of alcohol per 10,000 parts of blood. When you plug in the number into that formula, 0.1, again, the old standard, that's 10 parts of alcohol per 10,000 parts of blood. You reduce that down. It's one-tenth of one percent. It's not 10% of anything. It's a tenth of one that's a very small amount, so it doesn't take a whole lot to create major problems, even though certainly, you know, that's a huge amount, okay? There's no doubt about that, but it's not as large of an amount as people think. Again, in that formula, we talked about this this afternoon as well. Plug in my 5-2 guy, okay? It's 52 parts of alcohol per 10,000 parts of blood. Reduce that down. It's 5 tenths of 1%. You can take it down one more level. It's one half of 1%. 
It's not 50% of something. It's not 50% of a whole or 50% of a hundred. It's 50% of one. It's still, that's a large amount of alcohol, but it's nowhere near what people think that number actually represents. So, hope it's some insight in in some way, whether it's a legal uh, situation you're dealing with, whether it's a treatment situation, or doing the is I is or is I ain't, and trying to figure out where where we all uh, kind of fall on all of this. I want to thank everybody for being here this evening. Uh, It's been a pleasure seeing everybody again. Uh, Keep up the good work. Thanks for helping me stay sober one more day, and uh, see you real soon. Enjoy. Thank you. Thank you.